Oh, no. Testing the mic. Awesome. Oh, Yay, hey, no reverb. Now that we got the mic working. All right. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Applied Plant Sciences Seminar. My name is Andrew Stewart, and it is my privilege to introduce to you today um, the speaker at our seminar, which is Hannah Hall. Um, Hannah completed her undergraduate degree at Middle Tennessee State University, where she earned her bachelor's degree in, of sciences in biology. She is a second year master's student here at the University of Minnesota. Um, her advisor is Dr. Neil Anderson and her co-advisor is Dr. Don Weiss. Her research includes screening flax germplasm for ornamental traits for, and for, um, for cut flowers and garden landscape. Uh, one fun fact about Hannah is that um, her cat, she has a cat named Izzy, who likes to attend Zoom lectures with her, um, but unfortunately today she will not be attending the seminar. And uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Andrew. So um, my seminar is titled Phenotypic and Genotypic Studies of Ornamental, Perennial, and Annual Flax to Complement Curation, Breeding, and Molecular Analyses. So an overview of my presentation is we're going to talk about the history of flax in Minnesota, uh, flax morphology, uh, our breeding program here at the U and for Evergreen Initiative, and then talk about some of the linum taxonomy and genetics, and then get on to uh, my experiments. Okay. So his, like Flax in Minnesota in the 20th century, Minneapolis was the center of linseed, which is flax for oil production. Um, it was the fourth largest industry in Minneapolis, and we accounted for about one third of the total American flax production. But uh, interest in flax declined as uh, the cotton gin was invented. So some uses of flax. So historically, flax was used in paints, inks, and varnishes because it was considered a drying oil. And then the fiber, it was used in textiles specifically for things like linen. And it was also used in linoleum floors, uh, leather tanning, livestock feed, and various different types of medicines. So nowadays, we actually use flax differently. So it's considered a functional food due to its high omega-3 fatty acid content, the ligands in the oil, and then also the soluble and insoluble fiber. Flax also provides various different ecosystem services. So it aids in soil remediation and retention, water quality improvement, and pollinator services. And then also it can function as a specialty cut flower and a garden bedding plant. So some information on flax morphology. It is an erect plant with a leading, with a leading shoot, and then it has lateral branching from the crown of the plant. It also has a taproot that anchors it into the soil, and it has shoots that terminate into buds. And these shoots then, these buds then contain uh, five sepals, petals, and stamens. And then also has very showy flowers that come in a wide range of colors. So we're gonna talk some about uh, homostylus and distylus morphology in flax. So homostyly is where the uh, styles and stamens are the same length. This allows for self-compatibility and for easy crossing. And then heterocyle is where they are, the styles and anthers are different lengths. So this, they have a pin and thrum morphology. So the pin at, is the shorter styly and the thrum is where the uh, styly is longer than the anthers. So, and then we have an example of 
the different morphology over here off to the side that you can take a look at. And so some more examples are we have over here a long styled APAR flax plant. And then we have a short styled APAR and then we have a long styled North American plant. So you can see the different lengths of styles and anthers there. So flax can be divided into eight major groups based off of their morphology. You have uh, fiber, oil, dual purpose, which has qualities of both fiber and oil, large seeded oil, winter flax uh, for fiber and oil, dehiscent, and then cut flower and ornamental. So here at the U, we uh, have our flax breeding program. We actually had a different program back in 1894 to 1984, uh, which focused on breeding and disease research in the annual varieties of flax. So they were able to actually release several high yielding annual varieties and then different varieties that were resistant to uh, flax rust and fusarium wilt. Recently, uh, the flax breeding program has been reinvigorated in the past few years, and we uh, focus on ideotype breeding of perennial flax for oilseed, cut flower, and garden bedding. So what is ideotype breeding? Ideotype breeding is more of a whole system modeling approach. So we define our traits of interest and then we select an ideal phenotype for each of those traits. And then this allows us to prioritize multiple unrelated traits um, as we select for our program. And so we actually have the master student before me actually has published a paper on the perennial flax ideotypes for simultaneous breeding and development for agronomic and horticultural objectives that we based all of our um, breeding program around. So ideotype breeding in perennial flax. So for the oil seed ideotype, we aim to maximize yield, marketability of seed, and easy management. So um, our ideals for this type is an upright habit, uh, large seed size, and oil yield and composition that's very high. So for our cut flower idea type, uh, we aim to maximize the quality of stems and the value of our stems. Our ideals for this idea type are upright habit, long unbranched stems, long base life, and long uh, flower longevity, and continuous petal overlap. So some more about cut flowers, just so you have a little bit of background information. Um, flax would be considered a specialty cut flower. So these are cut flowers that are locally grown um, and also probably don't ship very well. They are mo mostly seasonally produced. And then a stem refers to a single stem from a plant containing buds and flowers. And then these specialty cut flowers would often enough be sold uh, wholesale or direct to consumer per like direct to consumers often at places like a farmer's market, as an example. So for the garden bedding type, we aim to maximize the ornamental quality of flax, consumer appeal, and then provide also pollinator services. Our ideals are large vibrant flowers with uh, a long flowering period and then a small compact form. So we are proud to collaborate very heavily with uh, the Forever Green Initiative. So they work on in developing perennial and winter annual crops and continuous living cover crops. And so they aim to improve uh, Minnesota's soil and water quality, their agricultural productivity. They want to increase efficiency and then also provide various economic opportunities to the community. 
And so they focus on domestication and improvement of crops as well. So some information on linum taxonomy. So there are around 200 species of linum in the family. And so it consists of a primary, secondary, and tertiary gene pools. So the primary contains the um, most commonly cultivated annual variety of flax, and then also the uh, wild progenitor of that cultivar. And then the secondary pool is closely related and can be hybridized. So all the individuals in that pool um, readily hybridize with each other. It is divided into two different lineages, which are the yellow clade and the flower, blue flower clade. The tertiary pool is filled with a distantly related species um, that if you are capable of crossing with them, produce uh, sterile and non-viable hybrids. Oh God. So, I don't know how to get rid of that. So this is an image of a uh, cladogram of the various different linum species. And so you can see how the different linum species are related to each other based off of different uh, genome duplication events. And then also you can see off to the right, there are the haploid chromosome numbers for each of the species. And so all these circled ones are species that we actually have in our inventory at the moment. So some more on linum taxonomy. The composition of the linum genus is grossly understudied. There are a lot of accessions with no botanical identification to them. Uh, they also don't have very consistent taxonomy amongst the genus, and then uh, there's no real reliable method of identifying the different species, which is unfortunate. So germplasm conservation kind of falls under the issues with taxonomy uh, due to poor identification. Um, a lot of the different taxon names are unresolved and only a very few of them are accepted. There are also very poor efforts to collect different wild populations of flax. And this leads to lacking in allelic richness and distinctiveness in a lot of the different collections. And so in total, there's around 81 gene banks with about 40,000 accessions worldwide. But only about 10 to 15 percent, like 10 to 15,000 um, of these accessions are genetically unique. So we have a lot of repeats in a lot of our collections. So this is a um, analysis of the genetic diversity of 22 Canadian cultivars. So it compares the genetic diversity of germplasm from the Canadian collection uh, by fixed loci. So the more, the greater percentage of fixed loci, the less genetically diverse that cultivar is considered. So as you can see, a lot of them are lacking some genetic diversity and have quite a few fixed loci. So some genetics on linum. Flax was the 13th species to receive a whole genome assembly, um, specifically the CDC Bethune cultivar. They were able to capture about 85% of the total genome and the rest of the 15% was a lot of genetic repeats. So, and then they estimated the size to be about 368 megabytes. So marker development in Linum. The Canadian collection that we saw the genetic diversity panel from before produced, their entire collection produced about 1.8 million SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so this is just a variation in a single base pair. And then they were able to find various different QTLs, which are quantitative trait loci, 
uh, which are regions associated with a traits phenotype. Um, they found QTLs associated with oilseed and fiber flax traits. So in the primary pool, as we saw with the uh, taxonomy of linum, um, it, is, it contains a lot of different diploids that have 30 chromosomes in total. They all easily hybridize with each other and are homostylists. So they have a very high self-fertilization rate um, with some genetic narrowing as you get to like the newer cultivars and then but they have found that the wild progenitor actually still contains quite a few favorable, favorable alleles for things such as yield and growth habit, which is good to that you can later reintroduce that into a line. Um, the secondary pool contains about eight karyotypic groups, many also having the same like 30 chromosomes, um, but this Variation in chromosome number leads to poor crossing outcomes often enough. So moving on, um, we're getting to uh, my experiments. So I have three experiments in total for my masters. The first one is screening wild flax for agronomic traits. So our goals for this experiment are to collect different phenotypic and germina germination data on the USDA grin accessions. So um, we also will be able to select individuals for inclusion into our perennial flax breeding program, and then also use individuals from the uh, grin system to cro test cross with our own lines. Our hypotheses for this experiment are that variations in species will produce traits of agronomic fiber and or ornamental use. And then crosses between similar chromosome number flax species will be possible. So some more information on the USDA GRIN system. So it stands for Germplasm Resource Information Network and is run by the National Plant Germplasm System. And they work to maintain uh, the characterization, evaluation, inventory, and distribution of uh, different germplasm data. So here are some pictures from the database. So you can see that they have the ability to provide information on just a basic summary, the taxonomy, um, and then different observations if the uh, data is available to input. So all of our grin accessions, we received about 150 of the 167 accessions that they had in total in their collection. And so, that came out to about 37 different species and we received 50 to 200 seeds per accession. And so they requested different flax descriptors for us to collect data on um, so that they can in, uh, like input those into their system. And then we are also looking at other um, traits that are associated with ornamental use that we are interested in and, and also scanning through their uh, collection for. So we're looking for things such as post-harvest longevity, um, lacking midday petal drop, and then uh, a long flowering frequency. So these are all the different descriptors that the USDA has requested from us. So we germinated all of the accessions that they provided us, and we sewed those into 128 plug trays with germination mixed medium. So they were placed into the mist house and then removed once about 80% of the seeds had germed. And then we placed them onto capillary mats where they were watered twice a day, um, sometimes more depending on how dry the trays got. 
And then we toothpick them weekly to uh, determine early germination. So here are some images of our setup. So these are the size trays that we use. Here are some examples of the toothpicking that we do. And so this just later when we look at them, we can tell when each seedling um, germinated and that makes it easier for selection later on. Here are some that are a little bit larger. So our highest germination rates were those that were greater than 80%. So about 37 accessions of the 150 had germination rates above 80%. All of our top accessions had uh, germination rates in the high 90s, and all of our accessions with very high germination also tended to germinate within the first week or so. We had um, about 16 accessions that had 10% or less germination, and then we had three different accessions that had no germination at all. So we selected individuals that germinated early. So we tried to select individuals that germinated within the first week or so, sometimes dipping into the second week germed if we didn't have enough in the first week. And we were able, we transplanted 10 plants per accession in the field. This was completed in June uh, after the risk of frost was no longer present. And then we record the flowering frequency weekly and any plant deaths that occur. So we have faced some challenges this year um, due to high temperatures in Minnesota. So due to that, we experienced some significant losses. So to combat this, we have germinated additional seeds and I was able to transplant those into the field uh, in September. So any of the uh, extra germinated seeds that got to a substantial size, we're able, like we're gonna now be able to test those for uh, winter survival. Here are some images of my plants out in the field. These are some of our unique species. And here are some of our other uh, yellow flowered flags. So phenotypic data collection. They, we are collecting um, some quantitative traits such as plant height, flower diameter, and petal width. And then we plan to analyze all this data using an ANOVA and HSD test. And we also have collected leaf samples for SNF data. And all these samples are dried at room temperature and stored with a de decessant, desiccant. So for our qualitative traits, we are measuring, we are collecting data on the color intensity of the petals and different flower parts. And then also uh, information on uh, growth habit and whether or not the plants wilt. So all of the color data is actually being measured using a Royal Horticultural Society color swatch fan. Um, an example is up on the slide. So we are matching them under shaded conditions. And then we will analyze all this data using a chi-square test. Here are some examples of us color matching the petals. So the number is the color and then the letter up and down the swatch is um, the intensity. And we uh, measured a, we did color matching for a single flower that best 
represented the plant for each plant that was flowering. So with our test crosses, we have already selected individuals from the Greenwich sessions, and then we also have our selections from our top uh, flax lines here at the U. And so when we do test crosses, it's going to be very dependent on the employee and taxonomic grouping of the individuals we are crossing with. And so right now we have propagated individuals uh, for crosses, and then we can do our crosses once they've gone to a substantial size and have started flowering. We can do crosses on the plant in the greenhouse. And then also we are capable of taking uh, stems from the plant and putting those into vases and doing crosses up in the lab. And so our hope is to possibly produce a multi-use flax cultivar. So one that has qualities from let's say oil seed and garden bedding or ones that are cut flower, but also have uh, some fiber qualities to them. So with all this data and our crosses, the USDA will receive uh, all their recorded trait data for their accessions that they don't necessarily have. And then they will also get the SNP data that we are collecting and they will get to know whether or not any of their accessions are misidentified in their system. We will get a new germplasm for our breeding program, and then we will get a wider range of samples for our tissue for our SNP analysis. And then any of the accessions that have 0% uh, germination, we can also do other uh, experiments such as seed staining to test their viability. So experiment two um, is linum genome marker discovery. So our goals for this are to analyze the genetic structure of the grin accessions and then also generate SNPs via DartSeq LD. So our hypotheses are that the genetic similarity of various species of linum will be determined. Uh, ideal type trait marker discovery will allow for us to be more efficient when we're making our selections. And then we will also be able to uh, identify any miscategorizations in the GRIN system. So DNA, so our analysis will be done for genetic structure with uh, genotyping by sequencing. The tissue sampled are from single plants out in the field and in the greenhouses. Once they've gotten to a large enough size where we can take a large enough sample that we could possibly do more than uh, one run with. So all the samples are dried and we hope to have about 50 milligrams for each sample. And then we put those dried samples through a geo grinder. And then we are able to submit our tissues to uh, the diversity array technologies for polymorphism identification. So DartSeq LD is geno genome sequencing for functional SNPs. So this utilizes lower density of molecular markers for full genome representation, which is often used for uh, non model species such as uh, all the different flag species that we have. And so we can then get the genetic structure among and within species in uh, other populations. And the analysis is done on our studio um, and, and we would run a principal coordinate analysis on those. So we've actually conducted, uh, or the master student before me has already conducted a uh, pilot study on the tissue samples he was able to collect. And so they sent in a 96 well plate that shows the relation of linum species and our lines here at the U. And we've learned that we need to re-optimize by species um, due to low call rates. And so we'll be dividing up our plates based off of species and sending those in to test for different primers. And so the image off to the right shows um, the relatedness of the different flax species to each other. So what 
could we use these SNPs for? The USDA gets to ident like, identify what their accessions are, like bite species, and then we get to find SNPs associated with uh, oil seed and fiber flax that we can use. And then we also get SNPs associated with ornamental traits. So we would be able to see possibly flower color, um, SNPs associated with long stems, and then also ones associated with little branching, which are very good for cut flower. So this is an example of some of the possible misidentifications in the Grin system. So this is a linum hirsutum plant, like two linum hirsutum accessions. So the one on the left is labeled as a hirsutum, but it doesn't look how we would expect it to. The one on the right is what we would expect a hirsutum plant to look like. And they are very different, so we would be able to test for any misidentification once we do run the uh, analyses. So experiment three is a base life evaluation of elite linum species cut flower selections. So our goals would be to gauge the potential of selections for cut flower use and then assess different solutions effects on cut flower traits. So our hypotheses are more closely related species will have uh, less variation in measured traits. And then floral preservative will result in longer total base life than the control. So we're gonna return back to the specialty cut flower information. So Specialty cut flowers are locally grown and often seasonally produced. Flax would be considered a filler flower due to its smaller flower size, and it would be used to uh, accent other flowers in an arrangement. So how we do our vase life setups, we would test three to nine stems per genotype, depending on how many vases we have available and then how many genotypes at once we would be testing. Our treatments include DI water and floral preservative, tap water and tap water and floral preservative with a DI water control. We've included tap water into our treatments because tap, tap water and tap water and floral preservative would best mimic what a consumer has available to them. And then we also have um, empty bases that still contain the different treatments and solutions so that we can um, get the evaporation rate from those. So we can determine how much of the solution is being used by the stem versus how much is being lost from evaporation. And then solutions are measured and changed every seven days. So our base life stem collection, we collect all of our stems from the field between seven to 10. This is when the flowers first open, and it's also before they begin to drop. So we have travel vases that we put DI water in, and we bundle up the stems by genotype and bring them back to campus. They are kept in cold storage until they are processed, and then they are all processed within um, 24 hours. And so processing includes stripping the lower leaves and making a small cut, just so that's fresh and then each is randomly assigned to a vase. So we measure the stems for link to first branch because the longer the stem, the more valuable the stem is. Data is collected every 24 hours and we are looking at the number of flowers that open in a day, the number of flowers that have dropped, and then any other observations such as um, stem and leaf discoloration. Open flowers are all tagged with a uh, different colored yarn based off of what day they opened. And so this helps us to later go back through and determine what the flower longevity for a stem is. So when do we toss out our stems? So termination is based off of various different symptoms. Um, they say to terminate a stem when the average consumer would throw it out. So 
we base all of our stuff off of different symptoms such as wilt. Um, drying is a major one that we've been seeing. Uh, chlorosis of the stem and leaf, loss of buds, and then also just general stem decline. And we analyze all of our data using an ANOVA and an HSD test that has all of our data coded into SPSS. So here are some examples of floral arrangements using flax. So both the flowers and the uh, seed pods or bowls have uh, ornamental qualities to them. And they all attribute a, more of a filler flower role and accent a lot of the other larger flowers that are in an arrangement. So for some future cut flower research, we can um, test uh, the flax's performance under different travel conditions and treatments. Um, we can also look at the different production styles, uh, greenhouse versus field production. And then we can also look at uh, stem and flower longevity um, with ethylene application. So in summary, uh, perennial flax has immense potential as an oil seed crop, fiber source, and ornamental plant. Um, information is lacking on the linum genus, and then SNP discovery will allow for fair selection of ornamental traits overall. So a very big thank you to my advisors, Dr. Neil Anderson and Dr. Donald Wise, and my committee member, Dr. Stan Hopinson. And special thanks to the Forever Green Initiative and the USDA CGC, uh, specifically the curator, uh, Laura Merrick, for guidance and funding. All right. Should I pop? Uh, sure. Does anybody have any question from the in-room audience? Yes. Does anybody in the in-room audience have any questions? I do have a question. Um, you're looking at the qualitative data for the color. Why would you like? Why do you use the shaded conditions? Um. Well, because if we were to like, huh? Repeat the question. Okay. So he asked um, why we looked at the color matching data under shaded conditions. Um, that's because if we had to do it over the course of like multiple days or as the sun traveled through the sky, it would possibly affect which color we matched it to and which intensity. So just doing it underneath shaded conditions, like using our own shadow out in the field, it just kept it a little bit more consistent. Does anybody else have any questions? Do we have any in the chat, Emily? Yeah. <clears throat> um, could you explain <clears throat> the purpose of the toothpick uh, test thing they did? Yeah. The so he asked um, why we uh, do toothpicking. So that's like a Neil Anderson staple. Um, so we use the toothpicking method because it allows us to at least record when things germinated. So uh, a big thing that we were looking for are individuals that germinate early. So this just allows us to keep track of who's germinated when, so we can make those selections a little bit easier later on. So once they emerge, you kind of explain. Yeah, as soon as we see uh, the little baby leaves, we would just like toothpick it with the color toothpick that coincides with that week. Yes. Yeah, so you said there were 81, this is your question, 81 gene banks mm -hmm. in 40,000 sessions. Yeah. And that there were 10 to 15,000 that were reviewed. Yeah. How do, you, how do you know that? Is that, is that a higher collection that you can take? Can you repeat that? So you said there are 40,000 sessions. Mm -hmm. There's gene banks around the country, and 10 to 15,000 of those sessions are you yeah, so 10 to 15,000 are genetically unique. So yeah, this, so it covers over the entirety of the uh, linum genus. So is that, they've been genotyped to do that? Like the SNPs or something? There's other 
I think some, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I'm sure some of them have, like given the uh, Canadian collection that has been um, tested for um, genetic diversity. But I just don't know off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I got a question. <clears throat> yes. So you said that Lenin was one was the thirteenth. I think the thirteenth genus with whole to genome assembly. Um, for a genus that's under study, why why did they do a whole genome assortment? That I mean, that seems to be a um. They actually uh did a full huh? Oh yeah. She asked um why, if Lenin is so understudied, why was uh, Linum, the 13th one to be have a full genome assembly. It wasn't the full genome or the full genus. It was just like the uh, a very highly cultivated cultivar of flax. So it was um, the Linum usisasinum. It was one of those cultivars that was cultivated for like oil seed and such. So maybe you could define genome assembly, full genome assembly. That's probably where I'm going wrong. I do not know off the top of my head. Okay. Are there any uh, questions in the chat? There are no questions. Just a reminder to the online audience, you're welcome to type in questions in the chat. You just got them. Oh. Um, so I, I, I um, so you talked about phenotyping. I think both the first and second names. Is that correct? Some various phenotyping and various traits. So yes. Some of those traits seem to be would be quantitatively correct. And so I'm just wondering what the experimental design was for that to actually assess um, to get a value that, that's actually robust in terms of these traits. Mm -hmm. So for, he's asking, um, for our phenotypic traits that are quantitative, um, how are we making the numbers that we get from those? Uh, well, what's, what's the experimental design? Yeah, what's the experimental design? Um, we're wanting to look at all of these uh, different accessions species under uh, field conditions. So they would like the expect like the phenotypic expression of these accessions is very different for going from the greenhouse into the field. So we would, it's just we want to at least record some of the data so that we can have it input into the USDA system. And so any individuals that uh, show some promising qualities for ornamental or oil seed use, uh, we select those so that they can possibly be included into our uh, breeding program. And do you want to read the questions in the Q and A, or would you like me to read this? I can read them. Oh, we can read. They can see them for themselves. Um, so Michael Burns asks. When collecting your cutting quality in vases, did you perform any normalization for plant mass? It seems as though larger plant cuttings may use more nutrients or lose more water due to evaporation. Um, no, we didn't really, we don't account for plant mass, um, but we do uh, kind of measure how, we do measure how long the stems are in total, and then also to first branching. And we also measure, we count how many viable buds there are on the stem and um, how many seed pods are on the stem. So that may account for some um, of the plant mass. And then Vincenzo asks, how big can you expect flower flax market to become? So since it would be considered like, it, since it would be a specialty cut flower, it would be a little bit of a smaller market, but um, individual, like uh, specialty cut flowers have the ability to be a little bit more uh, sustainably produced and better for the environment um, just because 
they are not taking, often enough, they are produced out in the field or seasonally, so they're not taking up resources being grown out in greenhouses and such. And then also there's uh, transportation um, factors that also affect um, kind of like the, how we see uh, especially cut flowers. Any other questions? I have one. Who yes. Did the, who did the floral arrangement? I am pretty sure it was Neil. <laughs> I want to say Neil. He loves that type of thing. So I, I actually have a question. Yes. Please. Um. Do you know what companies are currently producing flax for commercial use? Um, I don't know these specific companies. Um, there are some uh, seed already on the market. So there are named things like uh, Maple Grove, APAR, is, those are the two big ones. Um, but when we look at them out in the field, they don't have like incredibly great performance, honestly. So that means we just have a, we have a lot of work that we can do and we have um, a pretty good idea of how we would do on the market too. I actually have one little follow up yes. question. Um, so, would his flax like globally grown or is it strictly a North American crop? Um, flax is, is grown for different purposes across the world. So, I know they have a very large production in China. Um, I don't know anything about uh, growing it in South America. Uh, Europe, they tend to grow it mostly for um, fiber. And then Russia has uh, one of the gene banks. Africa has some species that are native to there. And then Canada is also a very large cultivator of flax for mostly oilseed. Do you have any more questions? No, thank you very much, Hannah. Stop sharing. So then, do, do we end the Zoom meeting though? Yeah, you can end the Zoom. Meeting. Okay. You're in charge. Hi, everybody. Do I end it for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs> I'm kicking you off.